here learned early on that New Mexico was a tricultural state. Well, I, like many of you, did. But today, I'm going to challenge you all to think about this tricultural concept a little differently. Now, earlier this year, Time Magazine interviewed Governor Susanna Martinez about comments made by none other than Mr. Donald Trump. <laughs> Her response to those comments? I listen to the people of New Mexico. I represent New Mexico first and foremost. I listen to the Hispanics, the Native Americans, and the Anglos. Now, <laughs> <clears throat> I am a black woman, born and raised right here in New Mexico. And this oblivious attitude by many can make black people like myself feel left out and invisible. I think it's about time we change this because I believe that New Mexico has an obligation to honor and respect all of her people. <clears throat> now, Growing up in New Mexico, there were some things that I learned to do and love. I quickly learned to pick out red, green, or Christmas for almost all my meals. Let me be clear, it's always green for me. And fall in New Mexico means walking around town and smelling that roast and chili. And those sunsets that are filled with the most beautiful reds, pinks, and purples you have ever seen. And the balloon fiesta. Now, I am a black woman, and I am a Mexican woman. With a black father and a Mexican mother, I quickly learned that New Mexico carries with her, like many places, a history of prejudice and racism. See, it was impressed upon my brothers and I early that this blackness, this is something that you should love, you should be proud of. And while we were taught to honor and respect both of our cultures, the reality is this is America and woven within the fabric of this nation is racism. See, black people in this country have been legally discriminated against for longer than America has been an actual country. Now, <clears throat> it didn't take long for me to realize that there were some from this other oppressed group that would take and internalize these behaviors because the physical features that my brothers and I carry lean closer to our black side, that's exactly how the world will come to see us. And I recall that my being half wasn't going to stop Mexican people from showcasing their racism towards us. I vividly remember a time my mother, father, and I, we pulled into a gas station. My father stepped inside, and a man jumped out and started banging the hood of our car with a crowbar. You nigger lover, you betrayed us. These were some of the things that he said to my mother. I recall another time, my mother and I, we went shopping. We headed into the mall department store, and I headed straight for the shiny jewelry section. I saw a piece I liked, and I asked to see it. The lady at the counter told me, ma'am, this is out of your price range. Now, I was young. And so an argument ensued, and about that time, then she called over her supervisor, and it was about that time my mom walked up and asked what was going on. And the lady said, ma'am, don't worry. We have this situation under control. Well, it was also about that time that they were informed that uh, this situation was, in fact, her daughter. <laughs> now, I've had many, many experiences similar to these growing up here in New Mexico. In elementary school, I vividly recall black history being given to me in the most basic and, and shallow format. See, I remember Harriet Tubman. She freed the slaves. And Rosa Parks refused to sit at the back of the bus. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he had a dream. Now, while all of these contributions are vitally important, I just knew that there was more out there. Now, New Mexico, it's where I grew. It's where I learned, it's where I made mistakes, but it is here that I learned to love my blackness. So I attended the University of New Mexico. I studied history, psychology, and Africana studies. And it was here that I gained a cultural 
context of my blackness. Let me ask, has anybody here heard of George McJunkin? Well, he was a black man, and in 1922, he led scientists to the discovery of bison bones right here in New Mexico. And these bones turned out to be over 10,000 years old, and it proved that people had been on this side of the country for much longer than originally expected. And what about William Cathy? Anybody know that name? Well, her birth name is actually Kathy Williams, and she was the first woman to enlist in the U.S. Army. And this black woman, before she was discovered, spent most of her service time here in New Mexico. And speaking of service, I know many of us have heard about the wonderful and amazing history of the Buffalo Soldiers. But did you know that some of the oldest black settlements in the country were actually towns right here in New Mexico? That's right. We have Dora, which was established in the 1870s, Blackdom, which was established in 1903. I mean, look where we are at. The African American Performing Arts Center. That's history. But black people are rarely, if ever, mentioned in these historical conversations about New Mexico. <laughs> now, I have since unapologetically shaped my life around activism and advocacy for the black community throughout the diaspora. And in my learning, one thing has become very clear to me, and it's actually rooted in an old but necessary counseling cliche. It says, you cannot learn to love anyone else until you learn to love yourself. Now, when I say that on an individual level, it resonates with people. But if I speak that same concept on a communal scale, people don't seem to get it. See, black people have been oppressed through colonization, racism, sexism, and capitalism. But the reality is that many times, cultural pride is mistaken for hate, when in fact, cultural pride has been the antithesis to hate here in America. Now, nowhere is this more important than in education. Now, I know you're probably asking yourself and telling yourself, now, Christina, Black people aren't the only people to experience racism or pain. No, we aren't. But now isn't the time to play Oppression Olympics. <laughs> See, <laughs> See, this is about representation. In 2012, the University of Pittsburgh and Harvard University did a study, and they combined found that when African-American parents instill an informed and sober perspective of race in their sons and daughters, these same children grow up to experience increased academic success. This is because representation not only provides a historical content and an understanding and a space for healing for these children, it also prepares children for the very real monster that is racism. I'm going to tell you all a real quick story. When my son was five years old in kindergarten, I picked him up from school. Tears filled his eyes, and he looked at me and said, Mama, I hate my skin. I want to take it off. The white kids at school told me that my skin was dirty, and I want to look like them. Now, me being his mama, what I really wanted to do was go find their parents and those kids, and we were going to have maybe some type of conversation. <laughs> but what I realized I had to do was I had to step it up. I had to make sure that every time he looked in the mirror, pain was not what he saw. I had to make it my full-time job on top of raising him to ensure that the images that he receives about himself and therefore his people were positive. In 2015, the black population in New Mexico was 2.6%. However, the dropout rate for black students was recorded at 64.3%. That is the second highest in the state. Now, knowing that adding a little bit of history is not a cure for a long-standing battle with systemic racism, what this does is tell us that it is about time that those of us who are in these communities 
take the lead and take charge and find ways to begin this healing process. Now, personally, you, you can't change the way people are viewed in New Mexico, and you really can't even change an entire school system by yourself. But this cry for representation by black people is not new. And it is about time that all of us stop and recognize our own individual roles within these problems. So by recognizing that New Mexico is not simply a tricultural state, but is in fact a multicultural state full of a vivacious history that very much includes black people, is a necessary step in the process. And some of you all have the privilege to enact change faster than others. Now, now I want us to all just stop for a moment. Considering everything we've talked about today, I want you to imagine what other amazing black contributions lay unearthed out there that you don't know about far beyond the Sandias. Thank you. <laughs>